Like me, do you get stuck worrying about your business's finances or what needs to be paid to the ATO, employees, super funds, and so on? The Australian Business Podcast is proud to announce that our sponsor, Grace Advisory, is offering all business owners a financial health check. Jordan and Daniel's expert team of accountants will conduct a review of your tax structure, bank setup, ATO obligations and reporting, as well as business insurance, and provide some advice on how to manage all of this. But get this, it's just $99. No matter where you are in Australia, you can book a $99 health check with the Grace Space team following the link in your podcast player. It's a no-brainer. Tell them Owen sent you. Welcome to Rask's Australian Business Podcast, a series for entrepreneurs who dare to leave the world in a better place and get paid while we do it. This podcast will make you a better business owner, investor, founder, or entrepreneur. If you want to start a business or already have one, please subscribe to the series or share it with your friends, business partner, or colleagues. And don't forget to consider taking our free business course, which includes heaps of templates for creating business plans, HR documents, employee files, all of my software recommendations, and more. The course is completely free and available via the link in your podcast player. Okay, let's get into the episode. This conversation with Nikki Shevak originally appeared on the Australian Investors Podcast, but it was just so good that I had to share it here with you on the Australian Business Podcast. Nikki Shevak is one of Australia's most recognizable venture capitalists. Having founded or co-founded the likes of Blackbird, and Startmate, amongst many others. Nikki's one of the most well-connected venture capitalists I've ever met, and one of the most illuminating when it comes to early-stage companies. In this conversation, we're going to talk about entrepreneurialism and what it takes to start a great business, but a business that might also be considered a generational company. We talk about Nikki's investment process and how he and the team at Blackbird find ideas, evaluate ideas, and invest alongside founders for many years. This is a fantastic conversation for anyone who is interested in the art of valuation and the art of finding companies very early in their journey, sometimes before they are even incorporated. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Nikki Shevak of Blackbird. Nikki, thanks for taking some time to join me on the show. Thank you for having me. We're going to talk about venture. We're going to talk about your journey to this world and then to the pinnacle of this world and how you think about the future what's happened in the past and even the present today and where you are. But I thought maybe we'll start with some icebreaker questions. And these are just a bit of fun, mate. So no need to overthink them. Kind of the first thing that comes to mind is what's the one investment you got totally wrong? Well, there was a company in 2014 uh, around Dogecoin. And this was, uh, Dogecoin was actually invented by an Australian. Mm. uh, And and so we'd got to meet the founder and then another Australian um, over in the US had formed a company called Doge Tipbot. This allowed people on predominantly Reddit, if you like to comment or you like to post, you could tip someone, you know, 10, 10 Dogecoin, which back then was like fractions upon fractions of a cent. It was sort of laughably nothing. Uh, it was an interesting community uh, that had sprung up and interesting sort of behaviors around that when there was just no friction to acknowledging someone with five cents and, and and the fun that came out of that and the social status that came out of that uh, was like very fascinating. Um, the company did not work out in the end. Um, uh, and I think we were the only professional investor in the world uh, to uh, invest in a Dogecoin company. Um, and then many years later, if, uh, Elon Musk um, took a shining to Dogecoin. And I think if we actually had invested just in Dogecoin at that particular point in time, uh, it would have worked out, you know, a thousand times uh, our, our initial investment, but it was, uh, it was not to be. Well, sometimes, sometimes you don't know if you're, you're early or you're wrong. Mm. So maybe, maybe we'll just take that as early. <laughs> or both. Or both, yeah. <laughs> okay. So the next one's a bit of fun and this one relates not so much to investing, but it's just yourself generally. If you could have one skill that you could acquire almost instantly, mm. uh, what would it be? I've got a taste for, um, listening to podcasts or audiobooks uh, on 2x speed and i just mm. if if you could listen to it on 20x speed or 100x speed uh, just imagine like reading is my favorite thing in 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 life and um if i could read or listen uh at 100x speed i think that would be uh, a superpower for knowledge mm. well um 
I'm sure someone listening to this right now will be going away and, <laughs> and doing just Adjusting that. their podcast to up to 100x. <laughs> That's it. Um, okay, final one. Uh, what's one thing you'll teach your children, maybe if it's about investing or even mm. if it's about life, however you want to take this, uh, that you think few other people would be doing? I'm a very uh, chaos is okay or pain pain is a good thing. Sort of people, I think, try to... Uh, eliminate pain from their lives mm. uh, like zero amount of pain is the is the right uh, amount of pain versus obviously too much pain is um is too much and is unhealthy but there is a there is some level of pain which is actually a, a healthy amount that spurs people on uh to, to 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 do great things um to progress and so i think um not to be kind of a hundred percent afraid of pain um because it it does tend to be a clue that you're doing some new things or interesting things or um uh, learning in an uncomfortable way uh so so pain pain is not all bad mm. it's interesting that you say that because one of the things that i try and impress upon nearly everyone that i meet is risk is okay when we think about risk as a society we tend to think about how bad that is but it actually can give rise to so many interesting things mm. which we're going to talk about i'm sure a few of those why don't we start there then with your journey was entrepreneurship starting a business was investing any of these things were they ingredients to you as an early uh, child i guess i i loved computers and i loved technology um that that was very uh in in sort of my youth uh the internet was just coming about and um a few years before the internet there were bulletin board systems where you had a a modem that you connected to your landline telephone and dialed up someone's number who was hosting a, a bulletin board system where mm -hmm. you could, you know, kind of chat with each other and uh, play computer games and yada, yada, yada. Uh, it, was, it was sort of like a, a very um, rough precursor to the internet. Um, so I'd always loved computers and I'd always love, love technology and, and, and so on. So I had that love. Uh, the love of entrepreneurship and investing, I think, came a little bit later. Um, Having said that, I did, um, as a kid, operate a, I had access to the internet very early on. This was when, before Netscape and mm -hmm. when it was a text browser called Lynx. Uh, and uh, I used to download NBA basketball uh, box scores and reports and hmm. um, kids at school would pay me $5 a month to follow a team. So if you're, you know, the Lakers, uh, I'd print out all the Laker game scores the day after wasn't on tv it wasn't readily uh, available in newspapers and so um i guess there was some entrepreneurial activity but it wasn't until university that i really fell in love with it and that was um around the time of the the original dot-com boom in 1999 and um i, I remember the, these uh, uh mag technology entrepreneurship magazines called red herring and the industry standard and they used to be like 300 pages every month and going down to the news agent buying them and that that's really i think where the imagination was set off i've actually got a follow-up question to this because in previous podcasts and interviews you mentioned that there are those unique set of experiences that it's kind of the phrase that you use and i'm keen to pull this apart for you what do you think it was that even if we just take that example, but maybe we can lead this into the next next question, which is that the things that you later co-founded, what unique set of circumstances in your environment made it okay to go and do things like that? Mm. I would say uh, I'd always been encouraged just to uh, to do things and to learn things. And, um, you know, as a kid built, uh, sort of, uh, radio controlled cars, uh, race, did a lot of sport co competition team. Um, that was always, always encouraged to do different things and to follow my instincts and to take initiative and, and so on. So I think that that's required, um, uh, in terms of possibility. Um, I'm an ultra competitive person. Um, and I will, uh, you know, do something obsessively to win um, uh, uh, at whatever it might be. Computer games, again, probably is the the, the big example in 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 the youth. And so, um, I think it was just always uh, uh, natural for me to go and try things and to do things. And business felt no differently um, to that. I, I find that there's something interesting that happens with entrepreneurs, and you'd be have a better window into this world than I do, of course which is where sometimes businesses 
are not born out of maybe what we would associate with quote unquote healthy habits or I guess views of the world. So anxieties and these types of things that bubble up internally and we maybe not even realizing and these things feed on that kind of entrepreneurial mindset, if that makes sense. Mm. And there's something I give a lot of thought to is where does it come from? You know, if we were psychologists unpacking this, like where would that come from? And maybe not so much with you, but just in general, do you see that playing out? And do you often ponder this question? Yeah, I think um, uh, people who are uh, obsessive and competitive and um, uh, the, those those uh, traits taken to the extreme can cause um, you know the undoing of someone. Um, ultimately, they can also cause the success of someone. Um, and even physiolo- physiologically, uh, uh, you know, uh, a high amount of achievers have autism. Um, and so th- there's something around um, traits that uh, can be both extremely positive from a entrepreneurship creation point of view uh, and obviously negative um taken to the extreme Mm. i often find like there's the i I think it was steve jobs who has the the quote or the kind of the speech where he talks about how i can't remember if he uses the phrase crazy ones but i can't remember exactly so i don't want to take anything away from him with it but basically says that in order to be exceptional you have to do something that is not ordinary Mm. and i think that's something which stands out to me is often i get questions around does it take something like that to produce something that is so unique? Um, you know, I guess the question therefore is, do you have to be obsessive to create something that people remember as that kind of like, you know, 10 to one? Mm. Maybe uh, they, all of the, uh, the great founders I've had the fortune to, to, to see up close have a sort of complicated personality. Even if you think of, um, entrepreneurship as a, a form of artistry uh, and any kind of uh, singer or uh, Van Gogh as an artist or uh, a lot of musicians um, ultimately uh, committed suicide. And, and, and so there is um, a, a dark a dark side or a complicated side to these uh, very unique individuals that go on to greatness. Um, and uh, I don't think you need that. I think everything is also... Um, not binary. It's not like you have something, you don't have something, you have mm. a degree of something or it's uh, a sort of present on, on a spectrum. And then I think for success, um, uh, you also require a complement of people. You need a balance of um, uh, folks and, and, and certainly uh, the, 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 you do need the craziness, you do need the uniqueness and, and, and the strange uh, to, to, to something, but you also need the balance um, and complementary uh, personalities around um, that that kind of visionary type person. Mm. You, if I'm not mistaken, you co-founded two businesses. I'm not sure if this was in uni or out of uni. Can you talk us through those businesses and some of the lessons learned? Mm. Well, the first one was only notable for who it was founded with, um, which was Mike Cannonbrooks uh, of Atlassian. He and I went to university together and were roommates together and, and, and so on. And mm. um, uh, he had also sort of caught uh, the bug of technology entrepreneurship. He was building websites when he was 15 years old. Um, he was Great. one of the uh, ones that I used to, you know, swap the red herring industry standard magazines uh, uh, with and so on. So we decided um, as first year uni students to start a company. The The company was called The Bookmark Box. Uh, this was back in 1998. Uh, mm. It allowed people to manage and share their bookmarks. And back then that was important because laptops were too big and too heavy and too expensive and people had different computers um, depending on whether they were at work or school or um, uh, at home. And so this allowed you to sort of manage and share your bookmarks across all those computers and then took a different turn with the product in uh, that it was uh, uh, a sort of um, way in which uh, to to attack web spam. Web spam was a real problem back then. This was pre-Google where people were sort of just writing random keywords in their pages and they would hope that they would rank highly for those, but we had this uh, sort of uh, about 50,000 users, 8 million bookmarks and kind of a clue as to, you know, what were the trusted pages on the web and 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 and, and to, to elevate those uh, uh, bookmarked pages higher than others in, and, and, and just as we were sort of taking the, 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 the product in that direction, um, uh, we ended up selling the company uh, to a, to another uh, firm in New York called blink.com. Uh, it, had raised lots and lots of money before it launched. Um, there were other companies that raised lots, lots and lots of money. And uh, we both sort of 
saw the writing on the wall or felt the imposter syndrome uh, acutely and uh, uh, we were the, the knife in a gunfight. And so we decided to run a process where uh, uh, to sell the company. Again, these are all highfalutin terms for what was, um, you know, uh, a very small kind of uh, financial outcome, but it was, uh, you know, a beautiful kind of two years of education. It was just, you know, a hundred kilometers an hour learning every single second um, uh, along the way. And, um, you know, I often say that uh, the bookmark box was was my university degree. Um, I met so many awesome people at university, um, but the actual content I felt uh, I learned you know, 10 times more via the bookmark box than, uh, than the university degree itself. Uh, then I moved to New York, uh, shortly thereafter. Um, this was post university and completing, um, university started another company called home thinking. Uh, it was a real estate, uh, website that, uh, crawled all of the home transaction data to know that a particular agent, uh, sold the most homes for the best prices in a in, in, in a particular neighborhood. And so you as a homeowner could enter in where your house was, you could get back a list of uh, people that had uh, this sort of quantifiable resume of uh, all the homes they, they sold uh, for what prices, how long it took them, as well as sort of consumer reviews uh, left by um, homeowners as well. Uh, so as a kind of quantifiable way to make a decision, uh, that business um, succeeded for a little while there. Um, it rode the kind of organic search wave um, of, of Google. This was in the 2005 period, um, uh, but ultimately uh, kind of uh, failed in its uh, quest to build a great business. Um, uh, it, it was wholly focused on just that who, who's the best real estate agent decision, whereas uh, the, the, the sort of traffic magnets uh, were very much the uh, the real estate listing sites themselves, so sites mm-hmm. like Zillow and Trulia in the in, in the US, where they succeeded with that consumer audience that they then tacked on this um, additional function of finding an agent using this um, uh, uh, way. And so the, the, the business ultimately did fail. I think the lessons I learned from that um, were, I was a single, co- a single founder and so to not have a co-founder, I don't think I'd ever do that again. I think that emotional kind of balance that is um, uh, uh, the, the, the feature of what you get when you do a, do a company with another person, another founder is um, uh, 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 I, would, I, would never, I would never not do that again. Uh, and then ultimately um, the, the, the sort of customer test of I didn't, I didn't feel empathy or in love with sort of the customer's problems. Um, uh, ultimately, I loved technology. I loved making decisions in a data-driven way uh, and I loved um, search, but I didn't love real estate agents and I didn't love um, uh, sort of their, their, the, the, the businesses that they were building. And so, um, you know, one test is if you see your customers in, in the street, do you kind of run into a laneway or do you uh, run up towards them? And um, that, that was not true. Um, for home thinking, uh, but has absolutely been true with Startmate and, and, and now Blackbird. We talk about uh, in technology, we talk about being agile, basically, which is for an investor, it's like the counterpoint, basically, like what could go wrong. Uh, and we often say that when you're agile, you almost you want to fail fast. Do you think the velocity at which you say, air quotes, failed, I'll say failed, but um, do you think the velocity at which you those things came and went was positive for you? I think home thinking was too long. Um, I, I, I do. The, the ultimate sadness is um, when something doesn't fail or doesn't succeed. There's a kind of third state in between where it kind of goes along, um, uh, but is not not going to be you know the outcome that people uh, wanted originally. Um, it's not you know, uh, a great business. Um, and so it's sort of, but, but failing that, um, there's no, you know, it has revenue, it has customers, it might even be growing. Um, but it, it just, it wasn't what was imagined when, um, the, the, the company began. And so I think, uh, home thinking, which was about sort of five years, um, you know, that probably should have been a few years, um, shorter had it all, you know, mm. perfectly, uh, worked out. Uh, having said that, um, the bookmark box was, I think 18 months. So that was, um, that was probably too short to really know, um, uh, could we make it or not in, in that original vision? Um, and obviously 1999 was 
one of the craziest times um, mm. uh, uh, in in the world of internet technology. Uh, so that 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 was the predominant variable there, um, rather than you know um, a, a micro sort of um, choice that we made. Mm. Because if people look at you now, they'd say, "Well, how successful has he been? You know, it's wonderful." And those experiences shaped who you are today. The next, I guess, the the next part of your journey is the really interesting part from uh, what you've built and what uh, have you have allowed other people to build uh, especially so i heard you say that uh, you were interested in finding other businesses to invest in and at a time you were writing maybe a couple of checks a year for twenty five thousand dollars to help um, entrepreneurs get started basically can you describe the problem that you identified with that and the journey you know, with Startmate and then Blackbird? Mm. So I uh, moved back from New York to Sydney. Um, and I think from both New York, but also I was in San Francisco quite often. And as I mentioned, um, in in the case of home thinking, you'd got to know uh, other folks like the founders of Zillow and Trulia and um, Yelp, which uh, mm-hmm. uh, started around the same time as um, home thinking and uh, had got to know a set of companies and a set of founders uh, that when I moved back to Australia, what struck me was uh, the people I was meeting here uh, were just as good as the people, the the best of the best that I was, that I was meeting uh, had met in, in, in the U S. And so that there was a, a sense of, um, you know, all of this great, this, this magic happening, but no one really paying attention. So that, that, that was a prompt um, for the uh, uh, desire to, to start angel investing Um Angel investing um, in the form of 25K. So not uh, yeah. you know, fortunate, but not not um, uh, you, you, you're not sort of um, a kingmaker in any sense um, if you're writing $25,000 checks um, into seed round companies. Um, and the people I was meeting um, uh, at the time, people would raise like a $300,000 round or a $500,000 um, seed round. And, and $25,000 wasn't enough to bring the round together. Um, if I was, you know, saying yes at, at, at the front of the process, um, I introduced um, some people I'd met uh, uh, to other folks that I knew um, to help that along. But it was, uh, uh, I would say, there, there just weren't that many people interested in angel investing um, in Australia in 2010 uh, at, at the time. So there was a sense of having to create. Uh, a market or to create something uh, that wasn't there. And that, that led to Startmate. Um, the other thing that was attractive personally was um, it would allow me to uh, do investing at a greater frequency spread across uh, you know, a greater portfolio of, of investments, um, but also speed up the learning. Normally as, a, as an investor, as a VC, you might invest in two companies uh, per year at a, at a sort of uh, uh, set pace uh, versus in Startmate, you know, we could invest in, you know, five companies, 10 companies per batch, do the batches twice a year, see hundreds of companies in each of those um, application processes. And so there was a rate of learning um, uh, advantage there. And then also um, what I'd noticed is uh, in, it, in Silicon Valley, the magic of Silicon Valley is when someone creates a, a successful technology company, they help and invest in the next generation. And, and that wasn't true in Australia in, in 2010. People who had succeeded tended to sort of stick to their own uh, circles or they uh, uh, might have succeeded and retired and bought real estate in Byron Bay, but they hadn't really shown an interest in investing in the next generation of technology companies. And so the other important element uh, of Startman at the beginning was this community of founders who were interested in, in investing and helping the next generation. Um, and uh, as, again, the batch unit um, enabled them to sort of efficiently help the next generation um, kind of uh, uh, in, in, in this format of uh, investment. So um, <clears throat> I, I would say I moved back, I started looking around, um, it was kind of slowly happening, but it wasn't very exciting. And then um, by creating Startmate, um, uh, uh, you know, we could bring all of these elements together. Um, I could personally learn much more quickly it was a better way to financially invest across a number of startups in, in, instead of a single startup. Uh, and, and then that, that was the beginning of Startmate. It's fascinating because as I thought about this over the weekend for recording, I thought about that community which you foster. It just creates connections, right? Um, and 
it's founders helping founders as well as the, um, I guess, the oversight or support of the VCs. Uh, when you think about that now, why would someone, so why would a founder that's listening to this, why would they go to Startmate now? Like, is it from their perspective, is there some type of tangible benefit in, in engaging with you? I, I Yes, absolutely. Um, the, the word I love uh, is accelerator. Um, it's not to say um, some someone who's listening can do something um, or not do something without Startmate. Um, it's can they do something much more quickly and make much more progress uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a set amount of time. And so I think Accelerator does capture mm. uh, uh, it beautifully. Um, every time you come up to a fork in the road uh, to talk to someone who has just made that decision recently, um, that that is the ultimate in high quality uh, advice uh, to be able to tap into a network, whether it is for hiring, whether it is for winning uh, a customer, whether it is uh, for raising money, um, that that sort of golden network uh, that people, again, feel deep affinity for the Startmate brand um, because they themselves were in that very same position um, uh, a few years ago. And, and, and it really is quite magical when you see mm-hmm. someone uh, make that request and, and, and 10 different people sort of uh, dive into to help and and to um, you know that, that that kind of magic circle of life uh, where uh, uh, those who did benefit are helping those next generation. Mm. You said before that there would be hundreds of applications for these, and run, does it run twice a year? Currently, yes. Yeah. How do how does it go from the three hundred down to the, the cohorts? Mm. So. Uh, all of the mentors, and again, the other important element was that the mentors uh, invested in in right. the fund, um, and so uh, the mentors make the decision um, as to who uh, uh, eventually makes it into the batch of startmates. So there's a uh, hundreds of companies apply. Uh, different subsets of mentors view all of the applications, and then as you get down. Uh, uh, to another level, then everyone reviews it, and then there's an interview day with the final, you know, call it 30 companies, and then uh, the batch sizes at the moment are anywhere between sort of 10 and 20 uh, companies, and so the mentors are involved all the way through that. Uh, and and I would say, both in Startmate's case and also Blackbird's case, uh, it's really that community at the heart, um, rather than sort of the expert on top of the mountain saying that they know everything and um, uh, uh, them being the the oracle, it's more sort of uh, the value of both Startmate and Blackbird is a community of other founders um, mm. uh, and Blackbird and Startmate acting as this network switch to those founders at those moments in time. Yeah, it's fantastic. It also makes, I imagine that also makes what you do easier because you can rely on this hive mind of expertise it's current Mm. that's forward thinking and you can leverage that as well can you talk us through then the the origin story of blackbird and maybe how it came to be versus where it is today yes so uh as i mentioned the the initial prompt of startmate was uh so that i could begin angel investing it was it was personally driven from that that side of things um and then what was very clear through the first two years of Startmate was um, that this is actually what I should be doing in life. So when I uh, began Startmate, it was only ever a part-time thing. It was two days a week for a couple months of the year. Um, uh, And and as I said, personally looking to to start angel investing, I'd I'd moved back to Australia. I was thinking, should I do another company? Um, And I had sort of was being playing, was playing around with a few ideas around, um, conversion rate optimization software, A-B testing software and, mm-hmm. and, and a marketplace around that. Um, but just instantly from Startmate, uh, it was just very clear that this 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 was actually the biggest startup, startup opportunity. Um, as I mentioned, there were all of these world-class people, no one paying attention to them. There were already these uh, uh, very successful companies at Lassian, WiseTech, Campaign Monitor, Redbubble, Akinex, et cetera, et cetera, that um, had already succeeded and, and no real investors from Australia paying attention to them. And uh, uh, they majority of them did have US Silicon Valley venture capital, but much later stages, they might bootstrap for eight years and then raise um, mm. around from those Silicon Valley uh, venture firms. So 
I, I think it was just very clear that this was a huge opportunity and, and this personally for, uh, w was very clear that this is what I love doing in life. Um, the people I met through the, the StartMate community, whether it was on the startup side or the mentor side, um, it was just unlike anything I'd ever had in, in, in a work context. And um, so that, that kind of visceral mm. uh, uh, success and visceral happiness from StartMate led to uh, uh, let's, uh, for me, um, let, let me make this my full-time uh, career. Let, 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 this is the most impactful thing um, that I can do. And so uh, in 2012, teamed up with uh, Rick Baker and Bill Barty uh, to form Blackbird. Uh, through the first couple of years of StartMate, it was also very clear that you could create these uh, global companies from Australia. And so what I meant is that even though the team and the company was in Australia. Um, all of the customers were all like all over the world. Um, it didn't matter that uh, they didn't know or care that you're in Australia, but they just uh, they bought the the, the software um, because it solved their problem, and um, they didn't need to speak to a salesperson. They uh, signed up with a credit card or bought it through the app store or, or what have you. And, and that particular type of business um, uh, being built from Australia that that was the original hypothesis. Uh, for Blackbird, uh, again, um, we'd seen the power or the magic of founders helping other founders. And so uh, the idea of Blackbird was um, we'd raise a fund and that fund would predominantly come from the, the founders of, uh, of those successful companies um, putting in their own personal money, but also their own time to help out the next generation. And so um, uh, in 2012, Form Blackbird took us two years uh, uh, end to end um, to, to raise all of our first fund. We did a kind of first close one year in uh, uh, to the journey um, and ended up raising $29 million. Um, it was so hard. Uh, we, <laughs> we met more than 500 people. Uh, there was hardly any venture capital left in the system. There'd been kind of two waves of venture attempted in Australia, but nothing had really uh, uh, succeeded to any great extent. Um, and so, um, when it was mentioned that you know we were raising an Australian venture capital fund, um, nearly every single uh, rational person um, <laughs> said, you know, "What are you doing? Why would you want to do that? That sounds like a, a paradox um, of um, you know, uh, no, a, a, an Australian venture capital fund um, is not going to work." And so, uh, uh, but of course, um, you know, it being so hard and um, it being very strange was exactly the best time to be raising an Australian venture capital fund and. The, the first fund was fortunate enough to invest in the first rounds of Canva and Safety Culture and Zooks and um, Culture Amp and Propeller and the, the list goes on. It was really um, uh, a very special time uh, to, 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 to be an investor in um, software and technology companies um, uh, back in 2012. Was Startmate uh, for, for DealFlow, was Startmate a key contributor to that first fund? Yes. Uh, so we... Uh, the, the reason Blackbird was separate to Startmate was Startmate was set up for a particular audience uh, of, of, of founders at a particular stage in the journey, like right right at the beginning. Um, and uh, uh, the, the sort of uh, fresh inception. Um, and so we always knew that Startmate would be a contributor to the Blackbird deal flow, but it would never be 100%. Um, it turned out uh, Startmate was 20% of the companies of that first fund. So about one mm. in five uh, investments came from uh, uh, Startmate originally, but obviously four out of five did not um, uh, come from Startmate. The opportunity uh, for Blackbird um, was, was sort of wider than that uh, original Startmate community. How did you, I'm just curious about that first fund because this is when it was, like you said, it was the ideal time in, in hindsight, but how did you find many of those companies then was did your network, was there anything that you did differently? Like, were, were these hiding in plain sight? They literally were hiding in plain sight and we were literally uh, a cup of water in the desert. Um, <laughs> uh, it was like, finally, someone is interested in investing in this kind of company. Um, and even for the people uh, who uh, were those investors in the first fund, it was finally someone is, is, is doing Blackbird because... Um, oftentimes they, they, had, they had built their own companies um, that were similar to this global software company and, and, and they saw up close what beautiful businesses they can be and um, uh, to, they, they saw other founders asking them out for coffee and um, uh, you know, that, that they saw the opportunity um, kind of firsthand um, from building their own companies. Uh, so I, I would say from a deal flow point of view, um, if you have money and you want to invest it 
in a particular kind of company that had been shunned and ignored um, in the past. Uh, the the you know the, there was no sales and marketing. It was um, uh, mm -hmm. you know instant sort of uh, deal flow. Uh, uh, but also from those networks, um, obviously the context you get uh, from. Uh, either an LP or another founder who knows that person, and and that's all valuable. Um, and 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 um, the the deal flow from those uh, folks is is extremely prized. But I think um, uh, to to keep it very simple, um, you know, we had a fund that wanted to invest in companies, and there were lots of those companies um, uh, who you know had not been loved by any other kind of investor before. Mm. People that know of Blackbird will know of this idea of investing in generational companies so maybe just to frame out the next part which is going to we're going to talk about your investment process and how you think about the the, the philosophy behind the the fund and, and what you do um can you just explain to us what what exactly you mean by a generational company so in 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 the world uh a small amount of companies will account for the majority of value. Uh, and if you look at in the US, the the many of the top 10 companies are technology companies. In China, the top two companies are technology companies. And, and technology in particular has this uh, characteristic of allowing uh, companies to uh, compound for a very long period of time. Google at hundreds of billions of dollars of revenue still growing, um, not this year, but last year grew north of 20%, which is just... Um, record setting uh, mm. uh, beautiful businesses. And so uh, in venture capital, um, the, the, there's a phenomenon called the power law, which is like one company tends to account for the majority of um, uh, value, which means that one company is worth more than every other company. Um, and uh, in Australia, uh, in the first decade of, of, of this century, Atlassian accounted for the majority of all value um, created by all technology companies uh, in the second decade. I, I'd argue that Canva has, has um, accounted for the majority value of every single technology company ever created in the last um, decade. So you have this uh, phenomenon that uh, is very kind of strange, um, but that that is how the business um, absolutely works. And so uh, the idea of, of Blackbird is to find those generational companies uh, right at the beginning uh, and then to invest in them at every single stage of their life. Uh, and so, uh, with Canva, we first invested $250,000 at the very first seed round. Um, we've invested more than $270 million um, just into Canva. Um, and so uh, the, the business of Blackbird is about relationships and, and, and those generational companies, um, which sounds a bit um, uh, general and, and squishy, but um, the venture capital industry is not structured like that. Um, the venture capital industry is... Uh, uh, sort of divided up into the round of capital. I'm a seed uh, fund that invests in seed rounds and um, I sort of stick to that particular stage, which didn't ever make sense um, to us. Uh, uh, and um, some funds specialize just in investing in, in, in growth stage companies and just invest in that particular round. Um, and, and so that's, tr that's, that's how the industry is structured. Um, we made Blackbird uh, uh, about the company and about um, forming a, a partnership with them very early on in their lives. Hopefully Blackbird is the investor in the first round. Um, but that relationship uh, uh, ultimately leading to the um, uh, uh, privilege for Blackbird to keep investing in the company. I don't think we ever deluded ourselves that Blackbird um, could outcompete Accel and Sequoia in a particular round without particular um, history. But if Blackbird invests in the very first round and builds a great relationship with that company, um, that relationship can outcompete the brand of Axel and Sequoia um, uh, when the company is clearly a success story and clearly um, uh, every every single person in the world would love to um, invest in that company. So the, uh, the strategy of Blackbird is to start at the very beginning and then to uh, invest in every single round of capital. Have you read the book uh, Gorilla Game? I have heard of it. I have not read it. No, sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. So the basic premise, if I could simplify it, so apologies to the authors if they're listening, but uh, the basic premise was written in 97 and is that you identify the gorillas that take the share, as you said, power laws, but you can identify them early. And the problem is a lot of value investors struggle with this conceptually because they tend to think is each individual investment is a value investment where at least in this book, the, the principle is that you take a, a broad approach to begin with, and then as the gorillas are identified, you 
move your chips across the table. And this is the idea that most of that value is captured and people tend to underestimate how much value is captured because what happens is as the gorillas emerge, the competitive advantage period, i.e. the timeline for them to dominate expands, but it also expands in another direction in terms of value creation and value capture. So you have an exponential amount of value creation over a longer period of time. And so a lot of people think like, oh, you know, in, in public markets, they think, oh, stock's gone up 100%, therefore it's overvalued. But no, maybe the value creation that's going on is exponential. And um, so I guess that leads to the next question. And this relates to, I think, where you're going with that point is that by being there on the on day one, I think you've got a thing on the website which says day one, day, I think it's like day 1,000 or day 10,000 or something crazy like this. Um, do you think that that approach, like that venture style approach is we get as many of these smaller deals as we can across the line to prove that we are here and we are valid and then the founders look more favorably upon us? Is that basically the idea? I, I would. Uh, so it's very similar uh, philosophy to, to, to what you've described. Um, but I would I would say just in the beginning, having a humble enough uh, approach to know this is something worth trying. This is something worth exploring and, and not overthinking it. Um, in terms of uh, wanting to know, you want to know every, every piece of information at the beginning, but you just don't, you don't have that until you begin um, exploring with the founder and with the company, whether it is a decent market, whether it is um, a problem people care about. And so I, I think at the beginning, it, it's giving interesting people with interesting ideas um, the money to go and explore those um, uh, uh, frontiers of, of, of the market and um, knowing that nearly every single time you'll be wrong. Um, again, you have to sort of train your psychology uh, uh, such that, you know, when you lose everything, it is embarrassing. It is um, uh, 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 humbling and it is um, uh, kind of just gravity uh, at work. Um, but uh, it's important um, to explore all of these uh, uh, all of these different markets and, and, and to see if new things can be done um, because out of it does come uh, you know, one out of 10 or one out of 20 times, um, something that's truly, truly special. And so uh, seed investing, the capital does um, almost like chemically react with an idea um, and make something possible that wouldn't be possible versus uh, at the end of the public market spectrum, you know, 99.9% .9 of every uh, uh, stock sale is a secondary. It's someone else owning the company, selling um the share of that company to the new investor and there's no change in the business um, uh, in, in terms of the capital going to the business. And so um, at the early stages, it's completely opposite. The business sort of has nothing and, and um, the cash absolutely changes the probability of, of, of that. So at the beginning, uh, I think you're um, going on an exploration and then as it becomes clear whether something is a very good business or a very good market, you're investing further capital um, over time. And so uh, I think at the beginning, you have to, uh, uh, again, just just have that sort of belief or that ambition, and um, you know, be be open to any different kind of direction, and not overthink it, and not think how it might not work, but to think um, if it did work, would it be you know very very important? Yeah, there's this um, this is analogy that people have, which is that investing uh, ahead of the curve is that it's about like connecting the dots, but then there's the again, I'll bring Jobs up again. He talks about it's not like that's only in hindsight. Uh, you, you don't get the number, you know, it's not as easy to just draw from one, two, three, all the way and it becomes a picture. But there's this idea of like mosaic theory and the quicker you can put the mosaic together, the quicker you will reveal what it is that you're investing in. Uh, and most people want to wait until they know for certain, oh, this is a picture of an elephant or this is a picture of a tree or something like that. We want to know what it is before we invest. And so people are always pushing to that frontier of how can I try and figure out what this thing is earlier on? But it seems like what you're saying is, this thing could become, this could, could be a picture of an elephant, but it could be very much a, I don't know, a snake or something like this. Like it reveals itself in time. And I think this is particularly important because you're investing most of the time, it seems, correct me if I'm wrong, pre-revenue. So you are willing to go to that edge and say, what is this idea? Then how can you use that idea and the initial bit of capital that we give you to then figure out what that picture is and where it should be going in time? Is that a general, I guess? Yeah, the, general the, sense? look, the other overlay I would add to that is um, the, the 
the clarity of the picture you get as an existing investor um, is a thousand times better than uh, the clarity yeah. you get as a non-investor. Um, or if you're just seeing the company during this sort of honeymoon period of fundraising, um, or you're just following from afar from media art, media articles about the company, um, there is nothing uh, greater than just the, the, the clarity of the information you get um, as to how the founders run the company, who do they hire, um, how hard is it um, to, to sell to a customer, how easy is it, do they complain about the price, do they not complain about the price, um, uh, the, the, the sort of good, bad and the, the ugly of the company versus just the highlights you get at that kind of fundraising period. So I think that that total picture of it, like, you know, seeing, the, seeing if it's an elephant, you see that with a lot more clarity as an existing uh, investor. And also, um, uh, I, I think just building, again, building that relationship, um, you're often afforded and, and you're preferred. Um, uh, fundraising is like a big process. Um, it mm. is um, uh, uh, incredibly friction filled. Um, you know, on the other side of it, it is healthy to have a group of investors. Blackbird is never the only investor in um, uh, a company uh, that 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 we're an investor in, um, but you kind of beyond um, a handful of uh, uh, supportive and um, helpful investors, you don't need five hundred. Um, and and so there's there's maybe three to five uh, investors that play that role with every company, um, but they would the company itself would actually prefer to be if they have a supportive uh, investor base to go through that fundraising um, and uh, uh, you know. Pricing, obviously, uh, they, they can um, uh, say whether that is a, a good price or a, or a bad price and test it externally if 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 they do think it's um, not a fair price. Um, but ultimately, that there is you know with a relationship um, a lot less friction to to them raising that capital. Mm. In I think I read that online, uh, maybe even being an AFR article about how terms and term sheets and those types of things skewed towards friendly for the for the uh for the founders uh but i guess one of the questions is like how do you what are some of the characteristics and there's a i know that there's a full thing on the blackbird website about the process you follow about how you think about things from different criteria it's really interesting so i'll put links to that but how do you think about the people because the people are paramount when a company is pre-revenue uh how do you think about identifying the right people with the ideas to carry that idea forward? Mm. I'd also say that um, Blackbird is open to a wide variety of people. And that, that's been, um, I think, part of our success is investing in people that look kind of unqualified or look a mm. bit too raw or look a bit too unpolished. Um, and I think even from the beginning of our journey, um, it was always very clear that the ultra successful cases, like people would say um, someone's a repeat founder as a as a compliment. And in, in some ways it is. But if you look at all of the ultra successful companies, the trillion dollar companies, they were started usually by first time founders, usually by people that were really unqualified. They just finished university or they hadn't finished university in the case of Microsoft and Facebook. And so we, we were certainly open to people with no business experience um, being founder CEOs and, and, and that in the beginning, um, uh, uh, I think stood us apart. I think people now uh, we're, are very open to investing in technical people with no bit business experience. But at the beginning, that was a that was a bit um, mm. more unique. Um, I, I would say uh, you look at um, can the person uh, like for, I, the, the 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 two shits um, for for <laughs> want of a better term. Um, do they give a shit? And can they get shit done? So do they give a shit? Uh, it's that connection between the person and the idea. Um, uh, what in their life has led up to that point of founding the company that um, has driven them to, to do so? You know, Luke Kinnear was a workplace uh, safety inspector before founding Safety Culture. Mel uh, from Canva had taught graphic design at university and then had mm. formed a high school yearbooks business before founding Canva. And so that, that, that uh, connection to the problem. Uh, and then... Uh, as you know, in life, um, there are a lot of smart people, but um, there are not a lot of smart people that go and do things. They mm -hmm. talk about things rather than doing things. And so just these um, often, you know, it, it could be just a couple of months of data. It could be just um, uh, uh, very little things. But if you see someone spiking on um, a kind of bias to action or they act really quickly or they just um, the raw output 
um, and or even just the rate of learning. So someone who's completely unqualified, but you can just see that they're how they soak up knowledge, how they act upon it, um, that 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 rate of learning, that vertical learning curve. That's something to pay particular attention to because if you do that for a long period of time, you end up as the best CEO uh, in, mm. in in the world, and people you know look up to uh, the, those uh, sort of cases after um, uh, they've succeeded. But you get the chance to invest in them, you know, when when they're starting from zero. And so it's it's that rate of learning, that rate of improvement, um, that rate of uh, uh, progress. Any kind of spikes or any you know uh, sort of glimmers of glimmers of hope amongst uh, what they've done in the last couple of months. Um, that that's that you should pay very close attention to that as well. Yeah, I was chatting to a founder uh, or co-founder uh, Nick Nicolaitis from Perla before coming in today. And he was saying that one of the things that uh, he finds really interesting about you is kind of that initial, that, that genesis, like that, the spark that goes off for these, you get these people together in this, you know, in ancient times we call them a tribe, but now we call them companies. And then they have the idea, they execute on something, but then something else comes of that. It may not be the initial, I guess, thought, but something comes of that data, whether it's like community-based data, whether it's A-B testing or something they figure out really early. So is that kind of like a, is that something that you see is very common? It's kind of like embedded optionality? Mm. Well, I'd say um, it's part of the process and I always like to describe ambition as the reaction to success. Uh, and, and so people might start off, you know, very modestly with their vision. Um, but if it does start to go right in in whatever little way um, that you mentioned, what's their reaction to that? Do they sort of say, oh, that's, that's nice that that happened and, and don't change anything? Or do they spot it and they double down on it and they uh, think, oh, okay, how can we apply that to everything that we do in marketing or sales or whatever it might be? And so this sort of re-raising of the ambition at these um, different points in time, um, trying to spot little things that work and make them work in a in, in a bigger way, um, that that to me is ambition. And, and those lessons of the business and then sort of th- thinking and reflecting upon them and then uh, crafting a new and bigger vision because of those lessons um those those are that's the ambition flywheel and so i think absolutely that that's um you know part and parcel of every story and i would say um uh part and parcel of someone being ambitious is that you know paying attention to successful things have you have you got any examples of that happening like to give people uh, i guess a, a visceral or just even just like a a thought in their mind of a name or a brand that might have done that even if it's not something you've invested in I would say there's there's always going to be uh, one one question that's interesting to me um, in in a company is uh, what what is their unique um, uh, take on customer acquisition? Um, usually, a company has some strange thing about how they acquire customers. Um, so normally, a company will come in and go, you know, we're raising money, we've just spent no money on marketing and sales, so we're going to spend some money on marketing and sales, and we're going to do, you know, headline Facebook ads, SEO blah, 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 uh, all at a headline level. Um, the interesting uh, companies uh, from a growth standpoint tend to have uh, this sort of insight at a ground level that's always uh, quite interesting and and, and um, unique. I remember in the case of Atlassian, um, actually before Jira, the Atlassian was involved in a lot of the open source community. And so um, one of the first things that they did when they released Jira was to make it free for open source projects. So if you're an Apache whatever project and um, they used uh, Jira to manage all of the bugs that people were reporting in the Apache web server or whatever um, uh, project that they might have given away the software. And then so those commercial people who were using Apache's web server uh, would go, oh, you know, Jira was quite nice to log all of these issues and track the progress and the resolution of them. Um, why don't I use Jira in my own company? And then that's when they pay um, whatever amount of money, $800 to Atlassian at the time to to use Jira um, privately in their own company. So that that idea of um, give it away free to public um, kind of uh, flagship customers or case studies um, mm. in, in, no, in the, uh, knowing that um, all of the people that interact with those public um, uh, flagship case studies will need it privately for their own business. Um, and so like when someone describes uh, customer acquisition in that sense, I get, I get very interested. And then um, obviously once they discover it works uh, uh, in one case, um, then they're reacting and saying, okay, how can I um, do this for all of the open source projects or all of the, 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 the ways in which um, someone might be using the product in a public setting? 
I think a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs nudge up against that issue of acquisition, right? Like we all have great ideas, um, but then how do we, we've got this great product and I find this with engineers a lot. We've got this great product, but why aren't people using it? Like this is what it does, this, this, and this. Um, and it's interesting to hear you say that with the Jira example, because we know that one, like it's, it's it was some people that are in the industry would know that one and how unique it was. Uh, and it's also, but it's also refreshing to hear that you can still do that, right? In a, in a world where it's basically pay to play everywhere you go on the internet, you know, Google, Facebook ads, whatever, like you said, to be able to be innovative in that way is very unique. And I've been inside a startup basically my whole life, um, not just with this business, but uh, I've seen that customer acquisition and sometimes it's frowned upon. Like sometimes it's seen as like, I don't know, scrimpy or like you're, you're the one that's, you know, boots on the ground you're pushing that line of what is normally acceptable whether it's taboo or something in the industry and people just get it done uh, you know they nut they push that up against that boundary and then a lot of people that have maybe have a superior product in terms of features they just don't they just don't get it because they're not prepared to go to that level uh, i don't know if you've ever come across that kind of idea of well it's also i think a like it's a system or it's an organism where yeah. even if someone you know just say at two opposite ends of the spectrum you have the you know uh, nobody marketing person and you have the highly technical um, engineer person and the, the highly technical engineer person starts off with a better technical product um, but the marketing person starts off with a technically inferior product but if they grow and they work out this scalable channel of acquisition um, then they use all of that extra revenue to hire engineers to hire to reform the product roadmap to to get all of that customer not only customer revenue but customer learning of all of the feature requests how they use the product what they want in the future what's the exact problem that they're solving um in in, in detail and there's like a there's almost like a flywheel there where um uh because you're successful in growth means that you are successful in uh the best information the best um you can build a way bigger and better uh, technical team and product and th there's like a uh so even though the, the starting points might be oh i had a better technical product they don't end up as a better technical product just because of this all-encompassing kind of network effect of um uh, uh revenue and information and team uh that that ultimately easily pulls away from the the, the person who started out better technically do you think that um many of these companies can reach that point like just before that point where uh you know were they using using a lot of no code tools or low code tools uh that, that, that look a thousand ways to be successful um and and um i i would i would again try to pass it through the test of um is it a unique customer acquisition strategy not unique from a pure you're the only one but like you're on the fringes and no one else you haven't heard anyone else you know mm. uh, uh trying you know whatever thing that's working uh for you and it ten tends to be also when platforms start up so like the early days of the facebook um uh, newsfeed ecosystem um, the early days of google search and whether that's on adwords or, or organic search um th there's often when these uh new forms of um uh, uh, new platforms emerge there's like a window where it's like you know embarrassment of riches for those people who interact with that um, so I think sort of always be looking out for that that uh, wave forming of a new platform um, or a new you know app store distribution um, again you know 10 or 12 years ago um, uh, a lot of businesses were built on the back of that uh, in the original times and then more balanced sort of as they as they um, succeeded uh, but um, it's that kind of new system that, you know, you, if you've heard about people being successful on it, it's probably not new kind of thing. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, there was this idea that you, you talked about uh, in a previous discussion where you talked about someone's life's work and this idea of that's probably like a structural thing, because one of the things that I see in not just private markets, but public markets is you see a lot of investing and a lot of people building things for the, the next iteration. So it might be what's happening in the next two, three, four, five years. But oftentimes they come and they go. And the structural winners, i.e. generational companies, if you like, it usually has someone or something that's like complex and yet it pervades the organization and it's designed for something that's like an, an unmet need that's not just transient. 
Uh, can you talk a little bit about, I guess, that finding that in people? Mm. I think it's uh, it's so it's it, it's so useful both in the beginning and then for the company not to end. Um, so in the beginning, um, you know that that vision in someone's head um, of what they want to achieve eventually in the world keeps them going. You know, in in this kind of uncertain beginning where it's not clear that it's um, working right away. Uh, and then if it does work really well, um, someone is doing their life's work uh, will actually say no to getting acquired at quite generous at the time uh, uh, valuations or, or, or dollar amounts. Um, but it's, it's, it's the company's progress is so incomplete that they know that the end of the rainbow um, is is a hundred times bigger than that whatever very generous um, acquisition offer. So to get a hundred billion dollar company, you need actually someone to say no to a hundred million dollar acquisition and a, a billion dollar acquisition because once a company is clearly successful, they will get acquisition offers and 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 really the person doing their life's work um, will say no to those very easily. Like I think the the famous example is. Um, Facebook saying no to Yahoo uh, for a billion dollars quite early in their in in their life, and people thought that was so crazy at the time. And now, you know, it's it's so clear that one billion dollars was a dramatic under under undervalu- undervaluing of um, uh, of Facebook. And so that life's work, um, uh, I think, also produces these products and these services that take responsibility for something happening fully. Uh, it's not kind of uh, I did my part and mm. you know that that's it it's almost like this um kind of uh, relentless uh, responsibility to say unless the world works this way um uh then you know I'm, I'm not complete the other thing is I think the joy is actually in its infinity uh that the fact that that mission is never achieved is actually the joy um uh in 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 the vision where um you could work for decades and still not be quite complete um you know increase the GDP of the internet, which is Stripe's uh, vision. Um, it, it's it's so wonderful in its um, unattainableness. Um, and so uh, uh, I think uh, also in when you have that kind of vision, um, the product roadmap expands. Oftentimes um, someone builds a product, great. Um, and then it just becomes about spending more on sales and marketing versus I think uh, someone doing their last work or, or a generational company, they build the first product, but that first product gives them ideas for the next five products and the roadmap expands and um, look at how Amazon took uh, selling stuff on the internet to um, the, the prime subscription uh, and, um, and beyond. Um, it, it's just that ever expanding product roadmap that would, uh, you know, can, can last for decades versus I think uh, companies where it's kind of like they launch one product and uh, they kind of run out of ideas. Mm. So, Nikki, there's a lot of quote unquote value investors who listen to the show and a lot of them would think, you know, if you say that like to infinity and beyond basically in terms of like the mission's never done, th- some of them may think, well, when do you get your value? Basically, how do you take that back? You know, there has to be an exit and there has to be this and that. How do you, and this is more so a, a question generally speaking, so I, don't, I kind of want it to be open-ended, which is how do you think about valuing, if at all, these opportunities? I've heard you talk about valuation as an art form, but how do you, how do you think about that being so early? Mm. Well, I, I, would, I would challenge, um, first of all, uh, I would say venture capital and value investing have a lot more in common than you think, uh, or at least the Warren Buffett version of value investing, which um, if you sort of divide up his career into three parts, um, one was the the classic value investing, which was like buy a dollar for 50 cents. Like it's just so cheap that uh, once the dollar is valued at a dollar, you make double your money kind of, um, and, Mm. and, and and, okay, if that's the, the, the brand of value investing, that's um, that is absolutely completely separate from venture. But the second phase of his career and where he had the most success were, was in this, American Express, Coca-Cola, Geico, uh, and it was really being a connoisseur of the highest quality businesses in the world. And I'd argue that venture capital is exactly the same. It's all about um, the creation of the highest quality companies in, in the world. The, the end result is Google and Microsoft and Apple, and those are, those are venture-backed um, companies. And I would, uh, you know, Apple is Berkshire Hathaway's biggest investment 
um, at the current time. And um, Warren Buffett is best friends with Bill Gates and his greatest investment regret is not investing in Microsoft. Um, so I, I, I'd argue that the, the two worlds um, are similar in that version of value investing um, of the highest quality uh, companies. Uh, and then the third phase of Berkshire Hathaway, because they have been so successful, they need to invest a lot of money. And so they need to do utilities and railways and, and, and so on. That's, that's again, pro- separate from venture capital. But the, the, the second phase is, is very, very similar. Um, the other, I, I would say, just having a long-term horizon um, isn't specific to uh, venture capital. And I'd say one of the weaknesses of value investors is this constant um, mean reversion. They're like, hey, this is a, a certain company at a certain price uh, point in the price cycle. And if it goes back to normal, I'm going to sell. And that, and they're constantly trying to, having to look for new ideas because they're constantly back at square one. Um, and, and that actually leads to a lot of error. Um, and uh, I, I, I would say that sort of like, it's just a lot of work for very little reward versus um, uh, investing. Again, you have to, um, uh, you have to appreciate the company. You have to invest at a, uh, a reasonable price. Um, but if you just bought and hold, held Microsoft, or you just bought and held Apple, if you just bought and held Google and, and, and um, uh, did nothing else, you'd actually way outperform all of the little, you know, mean reversion hundred times a year, um, kind of busy work that, that a lot of value investors. Um, so it's just like, if you're lazy, it's just a, a lot of work um, to, to do those short-term mean reversion. Um, and I would say the, the ultimate return on your investment thinking is um, how to appreciate those generational companies, how to appreciate the highest of high quality, and then um, uh, working out a way in which you can be a very long-term holder of those companies. Everyone's version of long-term is going to be different. Um, in the venture capital world, uh, uh, we raise a fund and that fund does need to be wrapped up in 10 years. So it's not an infinite time and, and it is a set amount of time. Um, but even 10 years is not, you know, um, mm. you look at the arc of these great companies, it's it's much more likely to be 30, 40, 50 years um, uh, in length. Um, and so everyone has their own timelines. Um, everyone has to consider the, the, the structures of their business and their, their own investing timelines. But um, I would say uh, if you want to make the most money, and um, you're actually lazy and you don't want to um, uh, do the most work, um, find the best companies in the world and just you know, hold them and don't overthink um, buying or selling of them. Is that, why, is that what gave rise to the follow-on fund? Yeah, I, you know, it, was, it was just very clear, um, well, uh, very clear that the venture capital industry was um, uh, strangely structured. As I said, the seed fund invests in the seed round. Um, and what that boiled down to in reality is that uh, you invested in uh, these, uh, you invested in a company before you knew it was successful. And then as soon as you did know it was successful, you proudly said that you didn't invest anything after that, um, which you know doesn't um, uh, make any sense at all. And then I would uh, also say that uh, that relationship that you built with the company affords you the opportunity to continue investing in the company. And so um, you had this combination of makes no sense to invest before you know it's successful and nothing after. And um, you've got the front row seat. You're the, you're the person that um, uh, as that company succeeds, you have the chance to invest further capital. And so uh, we, beginning from our second fund, um, we raise, uh, so when we raise a fund in inverted commas, it's actually a number of different vehicles. Um, it's essentially the, the seed funds, which is all the brand new companies, all the, the fresh uh, new rounds. We invest in about 12 companies in Australia a year, and we invest in about seven companies in New Zealand a year. And, and those uh, seed funds make those first investments in the companies. Um, we also raise a, a large pool of follow-on uh, follow-on capital called the follow-on fund, um, and that is for all the existing portfolio and all those companies that are showing the most promise. Um, that that it's it's beginning to seem clear that a company is being successful, uh, it will be successful, and so um, uh, from 2015, um, that decision to keep investing in a company. I would say is probably 10 times the size of Blackbird. So if we did everything exactly the same, we'd be one tenth the size that we are because um, of that decision to keep investing uh, in a company or not. Yeah, I was chatting to a, uh, an angel investor not too long ago, and he was saying that when you, uh, when you think that you, when you have conviction in your investments, you want to find a way to have the maximum amount of leverage to your expertise. And so if your expertise is finding great companies, doubling down on them when you know that they are working, that is the thing that you should be looking to leverage again and again and again. And it seems you've done that by having that structure. 
and being able to push that because I see that all the time. I see people like, yeah, we're a small cap fund. We're a mid cap fund. We're a large cap fund. And you just think, why don't you just hold the thing? <laughs> you know, if that's the best idea and if only in public markets, if only one, two, three, four percent of companies that create all the value, why not just keep holding them? You know, it sounds so simple, but that's that's just, a, I guess, a result of the structure and the way we set up finance in so many ways. It just seems backwards. Absolutely. Yes. I, I think look, the, the, the portfolio allocation model or uh, and the way in which you know, nearly every single institutional investor in the world is structures their, their their portfolio. That's the reason why there's the venture capital bucket or the private equity bucket or the small cap bucket or the big cap bucket or the Australian equity, the US equity. It's it's driven by that, you know, almost universal approach of, of uh, institutional investors to have that portfolio allocation model. But it doesn't make any sense from an investment point of view of, um, uh, again, the 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 person with the most context on that company, the person who has seen the elephant picture um, is sort of uh, uh, forced to step back um, when they know it's the elephant and then the next person, they're not clear if it's an elephant and the next person and so on and so on. Yeah, for sure. Mate, I've got one more question um, for you, but I might just um, ask you for a moment. Now, you've driven in here from the city, uh, into the city and uh, you've had this wonderful chat with us. If people are listening to this, if they're investors that want to get involved, if they're founders that want to get involved, if they're, and when I say founders, I mean past or present, where can they go? Like where where would you direct them to? Yeah, check out the website. Um, a couple of initiatives that were spoken about today were Startmate. So um, to, to be involved um, in the programs, either as a startup or a mentor. Um, uh, Blackbird, we run a number of different programs there as well in terms of uh, uh, Giants, which is an online uh, mm. community, people who are just sort of thinking through an idea and they want to uh, get feedback from other founders and, and, and other people within the industry. Um, uh, it's completely free and, and, and is a great program that you know uh, thousands of people go through every single year. Um, if you want a job uh, at a startup and, and oftentimes um, a precursor to founding a company is knowing the lay of the land or knowing how these companies do get created themselves. Um, we have a uh, a program called the the Lily Pad that sort of mm. um, uh, lets you meet uh, a number of the portfolio companies of Blackbird and elsewhere. Um, and, and if you're looking to sort of transition your career from uh, perhaps a, a more generalist kind of background into a startup uh, role, um, that 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 program Startmate has a fellowship program that's similar aim. And so um, uh, check out Startmate, check out Blackbird, and um, mm. uh, uh, or contact me. Uh, on Twitter, uh, <laughs> Nikki Shavak, or uh, email is pretty easy to work out, Nikki at blackbird.vc. Yeah, great. Um, watch out now. You might have to have uh, <laughs> a few filters on that. Surprisingly, uh, people do not, uh, oh, uh, really? do not take the opportunity. Yes. Yeah, all right. That's so surprising. Yep, yep. Um, well, there you go. If you want to get in, in touch with Nikki, and um, I'll put all the links in the show notes to that too, if it's more convenient. But the final question that I wanted to ask is what's one thing that you believe about investing that few people would agree with you on? Well, we have talked about um, the the way in which uh, the, the the institutional in investor world um, structures their portfolios into these particular buckets. Um, uh, I think the world comes down to these generational companies, and you want to have exposure to them across all the different um, uh, uh, sort of stages of their of their progress and all the different equity debt and so on. But I would I would say. Um, to me, a much better uh, way of thinking about the world is actually from that company attribute sense rather than the um, uh, the bucket sense. Mm, great. Well, Nikki, thank you for driving in here and thanks for taking the time to join me on the show. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Australian Business Podcast. I think this series is best served with my free business course on RASC Education. My free course includes all of my notes, templates, employment guides, legal documents, marketing strategies, software recommendation, and ideas for starting and running a small business. If you're a small business owner or an expert like an accountant, 
lawyer, investor or entrepreneur, I want to hear from you. I'm not 100% sure what we're going to do with this podcast series, so I'm looking for sponsors as well as potential co-hosts and of course I'm eager to invest in businesses run by talented people. If you're looking for a supporter or advisor, a silent partner or even an investor to support your growth, I can help. Please contact me via the RASC website. Finally, if this podcast or the course helps you, I only ask that you please help me by sharing it with one friend, colleague or family member who runs a business. Thanks for listening. This episode of the Australian Business Podcast is proudly supported by Rumble Coffee Roasters. Rumble Coffee Roasters is dedicated to helping you drink better coffee. Knockout blends, world-class, single origins, bold espressos, and flavor-filled filter roasts. Rumble Coffee prides itself on personal relationships with producers and customers alike. They pay farmers fairly so that they can invest in their land, their employees, and their communities. You can buy some beans to drink at home via rumblecoffee.com.au. That's R-U-M-B-L-E coffee.com.au. Or if you're a coffee shop owner, get in touch and discover better ways to serve your customers. Tell them Rask sent you. This episode is proudly supported by Rask Core. Rask Core is our all-in-one membership service designed to help you get the most from your money. Complete with research on ETFs, individual shares, bank accounts, term deposits, and so much more. Over 4,000 people are part of the Rascor community, and it is growing every week. To learn why more investors choose Rascor, head to www.rask.com.au slash subscriptions to find out more.